All right, good morning and welcome to the webinar doing business with the Department of the Air Force. This is a NorCal PTAC webinar, but we're very excited to have Brian Mizaraka from the Air Force joining. So this is the third part in a three-part series for Veterans Small Business Week. We also have Noah Harris, the director of the NorCal VBAC. That's the Veterans Business Outreach Center joining us this morning um, to represent his organization. And uh, Brian Mizaraka is an Education with Industry Fellow at Apple, sponsored by the US Air Force. Um, so he is um, going to be giving the main presentation today. Uh, real briefly, I just want to talk about PTAC, just to shout out that we are a uh, nonprofit organization hosted by the Humboldt State University Sponsored Programs Foundation. We're funded by the Defense Logistics Agency, that's the federal government, and uh, we help our clients win contracts. That's what we do. Um, last year, we helped our clients win more than $314 million, and we're going to do more than that this year. So we're really proud of what we're able to do for our clients. And we do it with counseling, bid matching, and resources and trainings. The first two of those things are available to clients who apply online. And you have to have a business that's located in a service area, which is one of those green counties there. Uh, this And we so we can sit down with you, assign you to a procurement specialist. They can go over all the processes that you need to sell your goods and services to the government. Uh, if you become a client, we can also set you up with a custom bid matching profile um, that gives you lots of bid opportunities that match what you sell every morning in your inbox. It's pretty neat. And then, of course, we put on lots of webinars like these with partners and we join other other organizations webinars. Um, and it's one big happy family. And these are always free to join for anyone from anywhere. So actually, everything we offer, we don't charge any fees. Um, as Noah pointed out a couple of days ago, we are tax funded. So Many of you have already paid for our services, so you might as well take advantage of them. So um, the long and the short of it is if you'd like to work with NorCal PTAC, if you have any um, questions about government contracting, reach out to us. You'll see my contact information at the bottom. If you'd like to apply, then you can see our website right there, norcalptech.org. Click on the red apply now button and get started. If you're not in our service area and you're somewhere else, you can click on that second link, aptac-us slash find a PTAC, or I just find the typing in the state and the county and then the, the letters PTAC will often come up with your correct PTAC in the area. Um, so you can do that too. So um, when I'm talking about clicking, of course, you can't click on the screen right now. I wish you could, but uh, you'll be getting the slides later today and those will have hyperlinks active. Okay, before we hand things over to Brian, um, I wanna hand things over to Noah real quick. Noah, as I mentioned, is the director for the NorCal VBOC. Uh, program, which we are um, center program in, in our area, which we're very excited to have a partnership with. So Noah, take it away. Thank you very much, James. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with this presentation. As James mentioned, the NorCal VBOC is also part of the SBA resource partner network of programs. Uh, we are focused precisely and specifically for veterans who are looking to start or grow businesses. And we also, uh, as far as the veterans, and really it's more the veterans and, and military community. So uh, that means transitioning or active duty service members, veterans of any era, National Guard or reserve members and military spouses. Our signature focal areas in terms of training are a boots to business, small business readiness um, course, you could call it. It's uh, usually either a one or two days. It's offered on the installations. And then for veterans who've been out of the military for a while, we have a version that is essentially the same information, but it's just more available for people who may not have access to an installation. We call it Boots to Business Reboot. And both classes essentially help veterans in really refining and getting clear regarding if they're looking to start a business how to basically go about doing it. It's really a matter of, okay, per the purpose, what is the, the purpose that they're looking to pursue? What are the processes they need to do to get that going? And also being able to help link some of the perspectives that they've gained in the military to help execute it. And as demonstrated by the partnership for this call today, we work with a lot of the other SBA resource partners, because the bottom line is no matter what the veteran needs, if he or she is already in business or looking to expand their business, we work with them one-on-one uh, -on -one to help them find uh, the path to do that. And in, in many cases, to build and refine um, their existing plans. So for some veterans, that looks like 
procurement. And we, of course, work closely with not just the NorCal PTAC, but all the PTACs in our region, which is from Ventura County in California North. And in Southern California, we also have a PTAC um, that covers uh, a larger uh, veteran population given the concentration down there, but we've worked very closely with the SoCal PTAC as well. So again, basically what it really comes down to is there is a lot of information. There are a lot of resource partners. There are a lot of uh, programs. And in many cases, part of what we do is help our, our veteran clients to navigate the landscape, select what's relevant for them and what they're looking to do and help them execute against that plan. And again, this is a, this is a long-term uh, type of uh, type of support. You know, my, as I typically tell people when I first start working with them, the idea is to not just make sure that they get what they need in the moment, but to long term make sure that as they continue operating, that they have support along the way. You know, you could kind of think of it as kind of like a business PMCS, you know, preventive maintenance checks and services, right? We want to make sure that along the way, no matter what your needs are, we're being proactive to make sure to meet them. So at any rate, if you have uh, questions or you want to learn more about the NorCal VBOC, you can reach us at norcalvboc.org. And similarly, just as James mentioned, um, there are VBOCs and PTACs and all the other resource partners throughout the entire country. Um, if you have any questions about that, for simplicity's sake, I like to say, you know what, just go ahead and contact contact us. We'll make sure you get uh, connected in the right way. And with that, without any more delay, thank you very much, all of you, for your service, your participation this morning. And thank you, James, for inviting me to participate as well. All right. Thank you for that, Noah. Um, and we're, again, we're happy to have this partnership and we'll keep giving you guys shout outs for our events as well. All right, we have the main presentation here. This is Captain Brian Misaraka, the U.S. Air Force, who's um, uh, in a, uh, what would you call it, a, not a fellowship, or um, industry education role at, at Apple right now. So we're very happy to have Brian here. Um, so thank you and uh, take it away. Oh, one more note to folks. Uh, we have a Q&A and a chat. If you guys have any questions that you would like read aloud, please enter them into the Q&A window. From the chat, we can use for networking and technical issues and things like that. Uh, but it makes it really easy to track if we put the questions in the chat uh, in the Q&A. And we will have a Q&A session later today. I um, mean, we're going to have uh, the slides as well as the video shared to everyone later today. It'll join our website. So you needn't fear about that. So thanks, Brian. Go ahead and take it away. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Hey, James. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Um, you know, thanks to uh, the greater PTAC community, the Small Business Administration. Um, thanks, Noah, for uh, the services you do at the VBOC um, to help our small business owners uh, to onboard into the federal government, both with the Department of the Air Force and, and all of our other uh, executive agencies. Um, just a minor housekeeping note from me, uh, I'm conducting this webinar from my house. And so uh, occasionally my alarm likes to go off. If, if it does, if you hear some dogs barking and then everything kind of goes quiet, I'll, uh, I'll mute. And when they stop barking, just give me a minute, I'll come back on. Um, like uh, James alluded to, uh, I'm an Air Force contracting officer with the Department of the Air Force. Uh, I've served in the Air Force for uh, just shy of 15 years now. Um, initially, uh, as one of our enlisted personnel, um, within the operations area, I was a parachute rigger for nine years, and then crossed over to the contracting functional area um, with assignments at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, uh, Hill Air Force Base in uh, Ogden, Utah, and then now I'm assigned as an Education with Industry Fellow at Apple. Uh, so that makes me a permanent active duty service member still, um, sponsored through the Air Force Institute of Technology, uh, but just assigned to the Apple organization in a learning, uh, in a learning role. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, this, I think there's my contact information in this uh, at the end of the presentation. And so any follow-up questions that uh, don't get a chance to get answered today, uh, by all means, please do ask those. 
uh, in a follow-up uh, email or LinkedIn is fine. Um, I think James, are you advancing the slides? Perfect. Uh, so here's some of the stuff that I'll touch on. Um, organization and structure of the Air Force. Uh, this relates to uh, finding, uh, can, we back? can we just, let me slide, oh, there we go. Uh, organization structure of the Air Force. This relates to finding a customer um, as a contracting officer. Uh, my role in the government is to, um, is to conduct the business analysis, to onboard, uh, to assist with the, with the costing and, and to bring clients in. Um, our requirements owners who are uh, the folks doing the mission every day uh, and program managers are often the ones that are responsible for developing the need statements um, and uh, identifying uh, how we'll evaluate technically. And often those are the best folks to be in touch with uh, to figure out where you align as a product or service in the Air Force ecosystom. Um, and, uh, and, and the contracting officer can sort of, certainly be a help or a resource, uh, especially when it comes to uh, negotiations, discussions regarding uh, costs, but, um, but it takes the whole acquisition team. And so the intent of that is just to provide a little bit of an overview of where everybody's at uh, so you can figure out where you plug in. Um, technology focus areas and operational requirements I'll touch on. Uh, there's, some, there's some high tech areas. Uh, and I know being in the NorCal area, uh, there's a lot of tech industry. Uh, we would love to, to outreach with anybody doing anything in the high tech area. And our operational requirements uh, we'll, we'll touch on as well. Those are uh, base level uh, things we buy at every installation um, that kind of keep the wheels turning. Uh, we'll talk about preparing to sell to the Air Force. Um, it's not vastly different, but I'll touch on some differences there. Registration reps and certifications um, is similar to uh, the rest of uh, the federal government. Although there are some new requirements and emerging requirements coming down the pike that I'll touch on briefly. Uh, locating opportunities um, falls in line primarily with the with the SAM.gov uh, construct that everyone's probably used to, but uh, there are a lot of agencies doing outreach in different ways and trying to um, figure out the best way to get in touch with businesses. And so there's often external ways to connect uh, tips for a successful proposal. And then I'll try to leave ample time for Q&A uh, because I, I think this is probably where we'll derive a lot of the value for this discussion. Slide. Um, if we can get back to that first organization slide, I think uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly on that. But it's uh, we've, we've got um, as of twenty nineteen. Um, I made a point to emphasize here, this is a Department of the Air Force, doing business with the Department of the Air Force. Traditionally, um, this briefing may be called doing business with the Air Force. And so the distinction here is uh, that as of 2019, um, the Air Force as a department was separated into both the uh, Air Force as a service and the Space Force. Um, so these service components to the DOD are responsible for organizing, training, equipping air and space forces for global operations. Uh, the department spends approximately $200 billion annually in research and development, procurement, sustainment, maintenance and construction. Uh, and it supports 680,000 active guard reserve and civilian personnel operating across a network of bases and systems. Uh, the distinction uh, for trying to reach your contracting officer or get in touch with the contracting officer isn't vastly different. All contracting officers are assigned to the Department of the Air Force and work for both the Air and Space Forces. Uh, but our program managers and our user communities have been split. And so if you're talking to somebody that's traditionally in like airframe and power plant, like an F-22 uh, that you can see in the, the image here an F-35, um, they're gonna be with the, the uh, US Air Force. And if you're talking to uh, somebody out of LA or Colorado, uh, or Florida that's doing something with space lift or satellites, um, you may well be talking to somebody that's in the Space Force. And uh, though a lot of the policies are aligned at present, uh, the Space Force is actively developing uh, new, new policies, new guidance that uh, better aligns with um, their, 
their way of doing business. So we do support both. Um, next slide. As, uh, as soon as we can get over to the next slide, um, this just illustrates a, the network of bases that uh, are operated under the Department of the Air Force. These are just the CONUS bases. Um, I'm not sure if James fell off there. I am so sorry. I'm having technical issues this morning. I am doing my best uh, to advance okay. the slides. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah. yeah. These are just our, these are just our uh, stateside bases. There are overseas bases that also require support, but I think this probably covers, um, you know, the vast majority of participants here. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's several in California, um, you know, several in the Western states, predominantly clustered in, I guess, uh, the Southern portion of the United States. Um, being located near one doesn't necessarily, isn't a prerequisite for serving at one or for working at one or providing services. Um, all of the services and products that support these bases uh, come from uh, all over the, all over the, uh, the United States. And, and we do our best to identify small business partners that can help provide these. Uh, and uh, oftentimes we'll set aside for hub zone or uh, certain socioeconomic categories when we when we do business for these type of needs. Um, each one is a small city. Uh, waste removal, landscaping, janitorial services, construction and IT are some of the bigger uh, areas, uh, bigger needs that we fill on these bases. Uh, but uh, at some of them, there are uh, organizations that operate, uh, that um, conduct aircraft maintenance and they'll need uh, tools and uh, equipment to, to help sustain those operations. Uh, every one of the bases has a, at least a clinic. Some of them have a major medical center, a hospital, and they all use uh, similar supplies and services as, um, as any other civilian affiliated network health provider would need. Um, that's become abundant uh, here in the era of COVID uh, with our supply chain uh, and some of our needs shifting. Um, and so our small business partners were critical to this effort over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, as we identified needs with ventilators and gloves and test kits, um, a lot of our partners um, were able to help us identify those need areas and developed into those niches and provided those services uh, in, a, in a very rapid and agile way that uh, our existing defense industrial base, our existing supply chain for those areas wouldn't necessarily have been as adaptive to. Uh, these services are, are typically available uh, through GSA schedule or SAMDOC.gov is, is where we, we would typically go to solicit for these services. Next slide. Um, so the this is where the organization of the those typical ba the base structure typically um, will will diverge. Uh, and so this is our, our greater enterprise buying activities. Um, so when we buy major systems, um, you know, through the product life cycle, that's uh, early stage research, um, science and technology, basic research that feeds into those technology areas. Um, we acquire major end items, whether that's a small UAV or a satellite or some other type of vehicle. Uh, the test enterprise, as well as sustaining those in the long term. So what that looks like as, as we use those items for 20 years, including the eventual disposal of them. Um, typically, the earlier it is in the life cycle, the more, uh, the more apt we are to use a grant or other instrument. Uh, so grants.gov is a good spot to go if you weren't already tracking that for research and development and maybe some test and evaluation. Uh, but outside of that, all of these will be available typically on sam.gov um, uh, unless those requirements happen to be classified and are not advertised um, but plugging in with these areas uh, knowing where you fit into this uh, the ecosystem is great uh, a lot of times uh, i think there's a misconception that these type of requirements are purchased uh, predominantly through our large system integrators uh, like lockheed or northrop which is 
uh, by and large true, but uh, there are ample opportunities for small business partners uh, to join in and provide uh, innovative inputs and subcontracting to these systems. Um, and so this, uh, this slide might be instrumental uh, down the road. If, if you identify as a, a research organization um, or a test organization, you can see here where those activities are predominantly conducted out of. Next slide. Um, I did want to touch on this organization briefly. Technically, they fall under our research lab, uh, but this is one of our innovative organizations. It's doing things uh, a little bit differently. Uh, they conduct a lot more uh, outreach. They're more out. Uh, they're, I would say, differently outward facing. So, uh, instead of advertising exclusively on SAM.gov, if you go to afworks.af.mil, uh, they will. Uh, oftentimes publish their own areas. They use a, a CSO as opposed to a traditional solicitation. Um, so they, uh, with the intent to onboard, accelerate and scale commercial technology. Um, the funding they use is predominantly uh, SIBR and SITR funds out of here. Uh, there is an Air Force uh, Avenue for those as well, uh, but this AFWORKS channel specific, specifically seeks to identify uh, user requirements uh, that can be met with commercial uh, technology, um, solicit for that commercial technology using a, a broader instrument. So instead of requesting um, a very specific capability, this will often solicit for broad uh, technology areas, white papers, um, and emergent product offerings that can be adapted to future needs. Uh, they're connected with our base level spark cells so uh, at, uh, on that previous slide where all of the Air Force bases across the continental United States were listed, many of those will have a spark cell, uh, which is uh, a, an organization on that base that's seeking to um, onboard emerging technology just to that base, either as a test bed or as a, um, or, or just to get after a specific product offering. Um, I don't know, I can, I can probably pause for a moment. Are there any questions on AppWorks or any of the, the organization stuff that I touched on? I'd love to uh, maybe hit on that this time. All right, let's take a look at the questions. Sometimes it's a bit, it can be a bit difficult to gauge whether they're relevant to your presentation so far. Um, when I have a guest speaker, so um, just let me know. Um, uh, Labiba is asking AFOSR, recent bids are very difficult to participate for small businesses. Um, the bid wording favors big institutions. How can small businesses find opportunities? Um, let me see. That's the Air Force Office of Scientific Research bids are difficult to participate in for small businesses. Um, yeah, I, so with, with each of these, um, generally in these large bids that, um, uh, or these large bid offerings where you've got um, where you've got, I'm trying to get out of this chat function now, where you've got, um, uh, it really looks like high barriers to entry and it's inclined to uh, go to a large business or even uh, on the research side, a lot of times what you'll get is um, uh, like, a, like a university that will participate, uh, but there are generally opportunities and in, in fact, robust opportunities for small businesses to subcontract uh, on those. Um, oftentimes, uh, participation in the subcontracting opportunities is best identified through uh, either a proposer's day or an industry day. Sometimes they're called uh, different things, but generally, um, that organization that's soliciting for that requirement will advertise in some type of uh, forum to come and participate. And if you, if you identify early that that might not be something that's um, achievable or feasible, uh, in scale for a company your size, um, it, it's beneficial to identify the company or companies that uh, are able to bid on it and attempt to identify partnership areas where you can tie in uh, maybe niche research or uh, very specific um, uh, very specific consulting services. I've seen that's helpful. Right, good answer. Okay. Um, this is a kind of specific question. I'm not sure to answer. This is about the Selfridge Air Base. Yeah. Uh, do you know if they? It, they said they didn't see it listed on the on the 
on the map. Is yeah, Selfridge Air Base was bracked in the 90s, I want to say. Um, and so that that does happen when they close a base down. And so it, it, there isn't active operations out of there. Uh, a lot of our bracked bases still do have some type of uh, operations that occur out of there, whether the federal government still owns the land and they maintain it, or um, for example, uh, I, uh, I'm operating at Moffett Air Force Base, uh, which was another BRAC base, but if you've ever driven uh, by or through this area in the Bay Area Mountain View, uh, you can see that um, it, it is by and large still uh, operational in some capacity. And so uh, all of the management for this base has passed to um, NASA. I'm not sure uh, what services would still be necessary uh, at Selfridge or who is administering those. Um, they may very well have gone to uh, another department in the government or, um, or gone to say like a department of the interior. All right, thank you. Um, and just let me know if you wanna, when you wanna cut off questions and keep going. We do have a question about um, FWorks here. Um, is FWorks solely for emerging technologies or do they also purchase commercially available and custom products through small businesses? Sure, yeah, uh, AFWorks, um, their bread and butter is dual use technology. And so if you have a commercialized product offering, a lot of their CSOs are targeted towards dual use uh, tech specifically. Um, and they, and uh, as, a, as an early stage evaluator on, on those items, um, you know, I can say with confidence that, uh, that the, the vast majority of those that were successful in receiving um, stage one, funding were those that had already commercialized and had a record of commercializing a product offering. Uh, so for example, if you've got software solution that is currently being used uh, by industry and you have uh, major partners that are supporting it, um, record of sales, uh, you would do very well in one of those commercial solutions openings to identify all of the areas where you're already successful and then identify how uh, you know, with some adaptation, that technology could pivot to um, to a defense customer, specifically if you can identify a defense customer. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, and sure. have, someone is wondering if you could elaborate on what the human effectiveness initiatives are. The human effect. Human effectiveness. Was, I think that was something that was on the map, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, it, so, it, it might so fall outside of the the capacity for the webinar and that's totally fine. Given no, no, that's fine. I think hum the human effectiveness, as far as I know, is covered under um, uh, is covered under Air Force Research Lab. Uh, a lot of times it has to do with our, our actual pilot efforts. So um, like the, there's a human performance wing at Wright-Patterson that deals predominantly with uh, the life cycle for those items, whether that's um, research and development, test and evaluation, acquisition, or sustainment. Um, and they onboard uh, technologies like um, new uh, new eyewear for pilots that can provide uh, laser defense against lasers and uh, new technology. Um, it might be a commercial parachute system. It might be um, another solution uh, geared towards uh, the human in the loop, whether that's a pilot or a space operator or a nuclear operator, uh, some type of technology that enables them to be more effective. Okay, great. I'd say let's go ahead and get um, get this. Yeah, let's keep rolling. And then, um, if you, if, do you have another uh, Q and A you'd like to do before the end? Um, you know, let me see. Maybe we can. Uh, I think we can probably roll through, and then I'll we'll take it. We'll take one more at the end. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Brad. Sure. Uh, so these are our technology focus areas uh, currently, as identified by. Um, the Secretary of the Air Force. This doesn't mean that these are the only technologies that we're onboarding, uh, but these are high interest items. And I think, you know, this probably doesn't surprise anybody uh, that, you know, microelectronics, uh, quantum computing, AI, ML, hypersonics uh, are uh, key technologies that we're trying to, to onboard. Space technology, of course, is an emerging commercial area. Um, and, I, and I think many of these AI, um, microelectronics, cybersecurity, these are areas where, uh, the commercial sector leads. Um, you know, most of the R&D 50 years ago was conducted within the government. Uh, today, only about 3% of 
the R&D in the country is, to, is done inside the government. And so we recognize that our commercial partners are uh, advancing some of these technologies at a much faster rate than we are. Uh, both our national laboratories, our, um, our uh, university partners, and the commercial industry, either through uh, technology transfers or uh, just independent research and development. And so these are areas that uh, the government is keenly aware of and interested in. I think uh, any any of these uh, would um, uh, would lend you to maybe an AFWorks uh, or even um, I'll make a pitch for the Defense Innovation Unit that's out of this area as well. Uh, they're a defense they're a defense partner, um, not necessarily within the Air Force proper, uh, but we certainly receive um, technology uh, through them whether that's something that they developed and it was identified that the Air Force could sponsor it or uh, it just becomes evident that the Air Force needs it. And we, and we go pull instead of push, uh, but that is, that's another office that, that we often will uh, onboard uh, technology from specifically in these areas. Next slide. Um, so in terms of selling to the Department of the Air Force, I don't, I don't know that it's vastly different than selling to any other federal government partner. Uh, you know, in the SBA and PTAC do a great job of uh, providing the education and assistance on this. And, and I would say leverage those resources to the mass, maximum extent possible, um, especially the ones that are uh, subsidized by the government and offered for free as opposed to paying for these services. Um, I know in terms of uh, myself and many of the other fellow contracting officers, I would much rather have you reach out to me and ask some specific questions uh, regarding these steps as opposed to uh, going and identifying um, or paying for a consultant to help you out because as I'll do it, I'll gratis. Um, you know, just the education, uh, this, this webinar, other series on, um, on how the government operates, it's, it's kind of a unique construct. Um, so look into the small business programs, identify the areas where uh, there's already an advantage. So uh, small business set asides, anything under $250,000 are automatically going to be set aside for small business. Um, and so those, those opportunities are ripe for small businesses. That's not to say that other opportunities aren't available. Um, there's, there's certainly uh, any opportunity where two small businesses are competing should go to a small business. So, uh, but leverage, leverage those uh, opportunities where they're available. Um, you know, some, res some, some resources that are also available outside of the SBA um, are, are the, the DPAP, well, the Defense Procurement and Acquisition Policy website. I think they're called DPC now. They'll publish some specific policies on small business, uh, DCMA, DCAA. Um, and then I would say, uh, you know, in addition, uh, get smart on um, maybe the government workflow. It's a wide area work workflow if you're not already um, uh, you don't already have government contracts, Air Force contracts. Uh, that's going to be a system that uh, you'll use to uh, both invoice and be paid. So uh, to identify uh, or define the product, market, and service. You know, know your know your NAICS codes. Know the, know the federal stock class uh, to which your product or service aligns to, uh, and make sure it's aligned well. One of the easiest ways to derail um, an acquisition is uh, for uh, that uh, for the solicitation to identify a specific NAICS code for which you haven't already uh, identified you do product or you do uh, you provide a product or service within and so uh, broadly look and, and identify what NAICS codes uh, your product or service could fall under and uh, register those make sure that your small business is uh, correct with those systems um, you know get registered for, for SAM, NAICS, DUNS, I, I, I'm not gonna I, I beat the dead horse on the registration because I think the SBA does a, a pretty good job, but uh, do get into the dynamic small business search database if you're not already there. Um, that's a tool that contracting officers will often use to do market research and identify small businesses and, um, and outside of the traditional registration uh, avenues. That's one that 
I don't know that a lot of small businesses necessarily register for. Um, and so it's helpful to, to know who's out there and, and it informs the set aside decision. So if I'm looking to figure out if there's ample small business participation or expectation that I'll get participation uh, to make the determination on whether to set aside an acquisition or not, uh, that's often a, a valuable resource for me. And if I can find more than two small businesses that participate or a handful of small businesses that participate, that becomes an easy decision to set the acquisition aside. Um, identify those opportunities. So um, Sam.gov is a, is a friend and probably a double-edged sword. I think it's uh, a little bit difficult sometimes to navigate. Uh, like I said, AppWorks will, will publish their stuff independently. And I think it's a little bit more user-friendly. Um, they're not the only ones to do that. Uh, Air Force Sustainment Center, uh, Air Force Lifecycle Management Center, a lot of these uh, a lot of the organizations that do solicit for products or services are now finding um, that they connect a little bit better when they solicit via a traditional website or through LinkedIn or through uh, Facebook, Twitter, other social media where they can advertise that to the broadest audience. Um, because I think it's often easier for us to find things, um, find opportunities or uh, have those uh, opportunities flow to us for there. They'll always still be published in SAM.gov. They won't be uh, discluded from that, but uh, rather than sift through the mountains of uh, data and, and uh, requirements that are solicited on SAM.gov, um, if you know specifically who you're looking to do business with and, and follow them on social media, they'll often publish what they're doing, when they're doing it, when their industry days are, um, and make themselves generally available. And then, you know, put the proposal together. I think the proposal adequacy checklist is a good tool. Um, it, it's always uh, uh, sort of disheartening for me when, you know, I, I, see a, I see a good small business go through all of these steps to uh, be educated, to define it, to register themselves and identify the opportunity only to uh, fall short in the proposal and be, and be determined non-responsive. Um, and so I would say uh, just really dig into the proposal um, and understand uh, specifically sections L and M of that proposal. So what, what are those instructions to offers, follow them, um, and how will you be evaluated? Because uh, that's the cheat code to the acquisition right there. Um, it's telling you exactly what you need to do, how you need to do it, um, and how the government is going to assess it. So pay particular attention to those areas. Next slide. Like I said, the, the registration, the reps, the certs, that's not vastly different from, um, from any other small business uh, contracting opportunity within the federal government. Um, but I will say some hot topics that have emerged recently are cybersecurity and foreign IT. Um, there's new rules coming out with regard to um, specific IT providers that you can and cannot use. So uh, if you're looking to do business with the federal government, particularly if you're an IT provider, uh, stay away from Huawei or ZTE um, and just be aware of the changing policies surrounding uh, foreign IT. Uh, that falls in line with cybersecurity, uh, but it's not all encompassing. Uh, the cybersecurity um, CMMC, cybersecurity matur uh, maturation model is um, being uh, piloted right now. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, broadly enforced, but I would expect that in the next year or so, uh, we're going to start seeing more requirements for CMMC certification or CMMC um, compliance, depending on what level you fall under. So if you're not spun up on CMMC, CMMC AB is a good place to go. That's the advisory board. Um, there's an accreditation body that goes into the CMMC and different levels uh, for uh, what uh, risk management steps a small business, a large business, or somebody who does uh, various amounts, uh, various echelons of business with the government will need to comply with. And then an emerging issue that we're seeing is, is clean capital. Um, a lot of the uh, technology providers we seek to partner with um, have been funded through venture capital uh, at some point. And I would advocate um, you know, partnering with our, 
with our financial providers, if that's going to help you build and scale and develop capabilities we need. Uh, but do be aware that there's a lot of uh, foreign incursions in that area at this point and, um, and seeking sources of, of clean or vetted capital um, is often easier to do at the front end than trying to figure out how to disentangle from that on the back end so that you can do business with the government. Next slide. So here's some areas that you can use to locate uh, opportunities. Um, I, I alluded to them all previously, uh, SAM.gov, Grants.gov, uh, the Air Force and AFWERX, Sibber and Sitter, uh, both published their own um, list of opportunities. Uh, we often will partner, uh, I'll, I'll often do um, GSA uh, task orders or delivery orders where those are available. It, it makes it much easier for us on our side. And so uh, if you think that partnering with GSA and becoming a schedule contractor is, is a good way for you to enter the, the federal government, then I would definitely advocate for that as well. Uh, Air Force Small Business has their own website. They publish opportunities as well. Um, and that's www.airforcesmallbiz.af.mil. Um, and so there's some interesting opportunities located on there. Air Force pitch days, um, these are becoming more and more popular as our collider events. So uh, the best way to get plugged in with these is just to know who's buying your product or service and they'll oftentimes uh, advertise a pitch day or uh, some type of outreach event um, where they'll, where they'll solicit ideas. Um, these pitch days will oftentimes have dedicated funding and they'll be able to put you on contract relatively quickly if they identify um, a product or service that they're looking to onboard. Next slide. Those tips for a successful proposal. Um, I would recommend engage directly with Air Force stakeholders. Uh, I think there used to be a time where users, contracting officers, and program managers were all generally maybe a little bit skittish. Um, and didn't want to, uh, I wanted to be sure that we weren't breaking any rules. Uh, the, the stigma around this is sort of changing. Um, we're trying to conduct as much outreach as possible. We're trying to be as engaged as possible. Uh, we're really trying to connect with a uh, commercial industry that's providing certain um, products and services so that we can be knowledgeable. Uh, we will go probably radio silent on you when we're doing a source selection and you won't be able to get much knowledge then. Uh, but both before and after those time periods, um, you know, any any of these uh, stakeholders worth their salt is going to be um, very much engaged. Uh, attend the advertised site visits and industry days. If on a solicitation it says that there's going to be an industry day or a site visit, um, I would encourage encourage you to attend. Um, COVID has actually probably improved this for us. Um, you know, previously. Uh, we would we would do these uh, in person, and, and it, the barrier to entry for small business was very high. Uh, COVID has actually opened the doors to a lot of uh, these industry days and site visits being virtualized, and so you can often I attend them from from somewhere else and not incur the, the travel costs that would go into attempting to um, just gain information about an acquisition, let alone you know make a bid no bid decision. Uh, so where where this might not have been a viable path before, I think now you might see this as, as more of an option. Uh, do submit timely questions well ahead of the proposal deadline. Um, so if, if you look at an opportunity and see that um, and have any any questions about it, it's vague, um, or you want to, to help um, uh, maybe identify areas where that could be improved, um, oftentimes we'll publish a draft RFI or RFP, uh, would recommend soliciting information on that to make the overall RFP better. And if there are any questions or anything that's vague in the RFP, uh, ask those as early as possible. Comply with all instructions to offers in section L and evaluate, understand the evaluation process in section M. Um, and then, you know, seek external funding through vetted or trusted capital providers. Uh, a lot of our SIBR contracts uh, through AFWERX particularly have a uh, funding blend now. So the government will put up 25% um, We'll expect the um, company to, to foot 25% initially, and then um, a capital provider will provide 50%. And so uh, we're, we're seeing more blended funds through uh, venture capital, uh, especially through those um, innovative onboarding for commercial technology uh, areas, whether that's AFWERX or GIU. Um, understand and incorporate feedback. 
and seek debriefing. And so this, uh, if you if you do find yourself mid RFP, um, you know, pay particularly close close attention to uh, the evaluation notices, um, make any changes that are being requested, uh, or at least ask questions about them. Try to understand uh, what the government is looking for. That's your opportunity to improve a proposal to the maximum extent possible to make it uh, as competitive as possible. And then if, if for some reason you don't win that, um, that opportunity, uh, do seek the debriefing. Just understand and get the feedback for, for what can be done better next time. So this concludes the formal uh, webinar portion um, and we can open it back up to Q&A. Um, okay, perfect. All right, let's see what we got next here. Um, before we go into the Q&A section, I just want to remind folks that we have a webinar coming up later this month. It's the only one we have on our horizon right now, although we're always organizing new ones. Um, and this one is a rescheduled webinar from uh, the week before last, which was Woman-Owned Small Business Week. So uh, this one is a how, to, how to get your woman-owned small business or economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business certification. Um, that's through the federal government. So please join us on the uh, 18th of November at 10 a.m., same time. Um, if you're interested in that topic. You can find more events and we also promote all of our partners events on our website at norcalpitech.org at the calendar. All right, um, and I've got some um, contact information here for Brian Misraka. Um, thank you so much, Brian. And if folks can um, write that down, you'll get the slides later. It'll have his LinkedIn and his email address there. Feel free to reach out to him with any questions. We got a couple questions about that looking for contact information. Um, all right, so let's get to the Q&A and see what we can get through. Um, if anybody has to leave early, just please know that you will be directed towards a survey. If you could, uh, I would appreciate, we would appreciate if you just let us know what you felt about the webinar today. We're always trying to improve our services, and I do apologize in advance for some technical issues on my end that were unforeseen, but uh, thanks for bearing with me, and let's see if we can get through some Q&A here. So, um, how effective is it to reference other U.S. military government agencies who have purchased our, our product when introducing to the, to the Air Force? Um, so are such references more relevant to the Air Force than private industry case studies and testimonials? I would absolutely bring those up. Um, any, uh, you know, we, we incorporated past performance as an evaluation factor uh, because past performance is generally indicative of future uh, performance or future ability. And so if, if there's opportunities for you to uh, provide feedback for other, um, other contracts or other commercial uh, areas where you've provided the product or service um, in, similar, in similar scope or fashion, I, would, I will say that uh, it, it can be, uh, it's, not, it's never detrimental, but a lot of times uh, if, uh, if it's not within the scope of the offering, or if it's uh, not at the scale of the offering, uh, sometimes it's not it's not as value added. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, understand that uh, in many ways your proposal is a marketing document as much as it's a technical document. Uh, and so, uh, really uh, making sure that the components that are being required and requested are as hard hitting as possible and are as clear as possible is good. And so if you have, uh, if the government's requesting uh, past performance data or information on, um, on efforts of similar size and scope, then by all means, um, link to that or share that information. Um, and if you don't think that, if you think it's outside of, of the effort or outside of the scope, then I, I would recommend limiting that just as it cuts down on kind of the distractors within the, within the proposal. Okay. Um, do you know if the Air Force is planning to do any research um, or do they do any research in air taxis business? Um, yeah, uh, they are actually. So um, the AppWorks has an app called Agility Prime. Agility Prime is primarily focused on um, electronic short vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Uh, and with uh, and I would say that while it's not necessarily advertised as an air taxi service per se, the requirements would mirror what you would be looking for uh, for an air taxi submission. I, I would look into Agility Prime. Thank you. And Suki's asking, what's the, um, 
I'm not sure if you, you probably won't have the contact with the SDIR, STTR for the Air Force, but is that something that you can direct them towards? Um, it, I think, you know, there's probably a, there's probably an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one here. If you want to shoot me a message, um, I can try to get you in touch with whoever I know at, uh, whatever specific buying office you're looking for. Unfortunately, I would say the Air Force doesn't do a great job of publishing, um, you know, a, a directory or a repository of, uh, contracting officers and the ones that do exist, um, you know, are often out of date as, as folks move on or move around. Uh, I, I have a colleague that's working on that um, to try to come up with a solution uh, for making sure that that's more public facing and, and it's great feedback here. So I can tie back in that, that that's something that's being asked for. Okay, great. Um, and could you say something about who your venture capital partners are? Um, you know, I, I don't know that we have specific capital partners. Uh, there are some that do uh, more defense tech related um, related efforts. I I wish I had, I wish I was more knowledgeable on this. Um, at, like I'm at I'm at Apple uh, doing an educational industry fellowship. I have two colleagues that are at uh, venture capital firms right now uh, that are doing similar fellowships, uh, and it's it's this is uh, well within their wheelhouse. So um, I can probably uh, reach back and see if they've got a list of, of vetted capital. If you go to Trusted Capital Marketplace um, or the National Innovation, National Security Innovation Network, those two uh, resources will list, um, it's, not all, it's not all inclusive, but they will list some of the sources of capital. Okay, great, thank you. They're not exactly they're not exactly the easiest resources or the, the trusted capital network is not exactly the easiest uh, to use but you should know that uh, if if you're um, down selected from a particular opportunity uh, that um, falls within one of the sectors of focus advanced computing uh, conventional weapons tech, engineering materials, and there's a whole list of them. If you fall within one of those technology areas and you're down selected, um, this is a viable path to uh, continued clean capital and funding, vice going to um, maybe a, a not, not a vetted partner. All right. And Lisa's wondering, uh, do you purchase through FedMall in addition to the GSA? Uh, the Air Force does not do very much uh, purchasing through FedMall. Um, and I, I want to say that there, uh, there's another, um, like a reverse auction site that we don't use very much either. The Army is much more active on those. Okay. Brandy's wondering, uh, what information is available through debriefing? And is there a process for requesting a debriefing? There is. So there are timelines and there are processes. Uh, those are both going to be find, found in um, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. Uh, Part 15 lists those out. Uh, and there, there is, um, in general, the, the information that you're going to get um, is either publicly available or has to do with your firm directly. Um, they, they, won't, they won't tell you anything about, uh, they're, they're not going to do like a side-by-side -side comparison of strengths versus weaknesses with yours and the winners. Um, there, there's opportunities to request some of those documents um, in uh, through like a FOIA if you really wanted to see some of that, although a lot of it will be masked, um, but uh, they will provide you feedback directly on your proposal. Um, you know, what, what critical deficiencies existed um, and potentially what areas could have been improved to make the offering more competitive. All right, and I'm just going to drop a link to the FAR, Federal Opposition Regulation, in the chat. Yeah. Um, all right, and for those of you who are jumping off, just remember that you can find the slides and the video that will be on our website later today. So um, uh, Quincy's asking, how do we find out about um, Air Force pitch days and industry days? Uh, Air Force pitch days and industry days are, a lot of times those are advertised along with either a CSO uh, on um, SAM.gov, or they'll be advertised with uh, a, 
a solicitation on the same forum. Uh, but the, the organizations that do those pitch days uh, are, or industry days are usually a lot more uh, forward facing. So I, it, I should back up. An industry day um, is, is a, a traditional term that's been used pretty commonly when there's a large acquisition just to get a forum of uh, contractors together, whether at the prime level or the subcontractor level. Uh, those will always be advertised within the um, within a solicitation. Um, the pitch day itself is is probably a more uh, modern concept, and the organizations that employ a pitch day are oftentimes um, very public facing on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And so a lot of times social media is your best avenue for identifying when and where a pitch day is going to take place. All right. Thanks, Brian. So we got a couple more questions here. Um, um, looks like the remaining ones are pretty specific to industry. So if anyone has any more uh, general questions that concern everyone, um, please let us know before we end the, the webinar. Um, Lisa is wondering, uh, do you purchase through EPS and DVSB program? I am not familiar with those programs. I, I would say no. All right. It's unlikely if, if he's not familiar with it, but, yeah. <laughs> but again, for a, lot, for a lot of these questions who are not sure, feel, feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, Brian may know better uh, for Air Force things than I do, but uh, we can certainly help you figure it out. Um, is there demand for certified commercial drone pilots? Um, is there demand for certified commercial drone pilots drone pilots that's right um yes yes there is um we have we have a couple of different so both both on the manned and unmanned side of the house uh there are um there are contracts for both uh commercial pilots of traditional man systems as well as uh, commercial drone pilots. Um, I would, I would say that those, those, um, those are generally solicited towards a vendor that, so not on like an individual basis. So those would be solicited towards uh, vendors that uh, can provide uh, an, out, an out of the box capability. So they often operate as a GOCO, government owned contractor operated model. Uh, so what that would look like is uh, the government owns a fleet of drones. We're looking for a contractor that can manage that fleet, can upkeep the fleet, can, can fly them on behalf of the Air Force and provide data back to the government. Um, they're generally larger. The best way if you're an individual commercial drone pilot to get on those is to identify the prime contractor that's providing those services um, and, and onboard through them. Okay, great. And we have one last question. Uh, Christopher's wondering um, if you have any foresight whether Air Force bases are updating their base and land management or environmental management. Um, or, or they have planned infrastructure updates. Um, do you foresee lots of environmental compliance needs for Air Force bases in the coming years? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is occurring all the time. Uh, it was very prevalent for me when I was at Langley. Uh, these requirements will predominantly flow through uh, civil engineer unit. Some of them are executed at the base level, and some of these get executed at um, the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. Uh, at, I believe they're in Florida, Tyndall. Um, it'll all get advertised on SAM.gov, uh, but just depending on how they're doing it. So if it's a broad, um, if it's a broad requirement that applies to every Air Force base across the country, you'll likely see it balled up as one big requirement at uh, the Air Force Civil Engineer Center versus uh, when I was at Langley, we would see um, small environmental improvements that had to do with the Tidewater area executed through uh, the civil engineer unit there, uh, but constantly. So the um, Air Force is required to comply with all federal uh, mandates on environmental and um, uh, hydro, 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 
geological type issues. And so um, we are, we're constantly doing that in addition to executing usually um, a planned infrastructure management strategy. So there's always opportunities both on new and emerging requirements and existing kind of uh, infrastructure roadmaps. All right, thanks so much, Brian. And with that, I think that that was gonna wrap up our Q and A. We got a thanks from Kristen, uh, good, excuse me, Christopher, more or less here. So thanks Christopher for the excellent question. Um, so thanks Brian for all your research and putting this together and showing up. We really appreciate it. Thanks yeah. as usual to Noah uh, for joining this week and getting this partnership kicked off uh, in style. And thanks everyone. We had a nice turnout today. We had a lot of great questions and we really appreciate all of you coming in and showing up and participating. As I mentioned, the slides as well as the video recording that we're doing right now, will be joining uh, the other past archive webinars on our website. I put the link in the chat. And so you'll be able to find that later today once it's finished processing. I've also put a link in the chat for a survey to let us know how you felt about today's webinar, um, which we greatly appreciate. So thanks uh, and I hope everyone has a very nice Thursday. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.